kind of problems we see in a significant magnitude in, in India or in some other parts of the developing world, a lot of those problems in different levels of intensity were actually there in Adelaide. We had littering, we, had, we, were, we were generating a significant amount of waste per capita. Um, we had un uncoordinated governance structure. Uh, illegal dumping happened. You know, there was also issues with uh, massive loss of uh, seagrass and, uh, and pollution of the ocean because of very high nutrient discharge into the wastewater, of the wastewater into the ocean. In some areas, we had a lowering of the groundwater up to 300 meters. We had issues. Even air, air quality, you know, because of backyard burning was, was an issue. But then, how in 30 years those challenges have been overcome? Currently, the waste recycling, the waste diversion from landfill would be close to 84%. It will reach around 90% in another year's time because of, we are also getting, you know, some other interventions. Um, we are recycling close to 50 gigaliters of water per annum of uh, both wastewater and stormwater, which actually can be uh, almost supplied to a population of half a million people. Currently, nearly 60% of the energy is all renewable in the state, and that will reach 75% by 2022. If you Google Adelaide, not many people know. So it is one of the top most five livable cities for the last 10, 15 years, you know, with, with, the, with the attributes it has got. And it has got a number of uh, pioneering initiatives it, it, has, it has done over the last 30 years. And I'll kind of show them more in a pictorial way. And the journey was driven by necessity. It required um, phenomenal collaboration and synergy, which I think is critical if you want to move in that direction. And I'm going to talk about circular economy now because that is something, and I want to demystify it as much as I can. It's basically uh, an alternative to a typical traditional linear, linear model of develop, economic model of development where we, we produce goods, we use them, and then we actually uh, discard them. And I always maintain this belief that waste, to me, is a resource at a wrong place. Just an opportunity, you know, just Google some reports. Uh, for the world, they, they, recommend that, they reckon that nearly $4.6 trillion of opportunity exists because of circular economy per, per annum. Just in a country like India, $630 billion per annum can be your net GDP, increase in GDP by circular economy. So uh, without further ado, I'll just quickly play the video. Adelaide, capital of South Australia, one of the world's most progressive green states and host of the Global Leadership Program on the Circular Economy. At the core of the program are hosted visits to major businesses which are leaders in the circular economy. In five full days, you'll see many aspects of the circular economy in practice, and you'll learn from the businesses and people who are making it a success. The program covers four themes. Circular economy policy and practice, including waste minimization, recycling, climate change, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. Water management, how Adelaide's a leader in wastewater reuse, water-sensitive urban design, stormwater reuse, wetlands, and aquifer storage. Community and society, focusing on how to change behavior, and industry and technology, including innovation incubators and resource efficiency. Thank you very much, guys, and I will now get the uh, panel discussion going. My first, I guess, question, and I think it is uh, to the Commissioner from WISAC, considering the circular economy as a paradigm, how would, you, how would you relate and how would you actually try to incorporate that into the smart city development that you are doing? Vishakapatnam has recently been able to, you know, design a project where we will be laying close to 650 square, uh, 650 kilometers of sewerage lines and uh, close to 776 million liters per day of water is to be treated and supplied to industries for reuse. So, and uh, we have been also able to, you know, commercially close this project. It would be one of those significant projects in the country where we have been able to commercially convince banks, commercial banks, 
supplied to large industries. So, uh, rightfully speaking, we have been able to close one sector in the circular economy, that is water. And uh, I must really uh, thank, uh, you know, something like a Swachh Bharat mission or smart cities which has given us a vision today in urban governance. Post the Swachh Bharat mission, the way we look at waste or the way we handle waste, there is a tremendous difference. So I think India is now in the cusp where we need to be moving in that direction continuously. And we have also taken the help of USTDA in, you know, identifying certain projects that which gives us a master plan framework which talks about sustainability. We are talking about uh, electric transportation, we are talking about rejuvenation for canal systems, etc. Circular economy is something for the future and I think a country like India, which is, uh, you know, still having 30% of people living below the, below the poverty line, I think we have a long way to go, especially, you know, creating that sense of uh, civic sense among people to, you know, look at how they can handle waste and help the corp corporations in handling waste. Moving forward, um, can I actually um, ask um, Ramnath to actually share, there's a slide, there's a slide that he wants to share which is pretty innovative about a circular city. This, the Swedish have failed in kind of, you know, trying to get everything together because especially in the commissioner's face, yes, he's got a problem with municipal solid waste. He's wondering what to do with it. He's got, uh, there are a lot of solutions. So what we as a company do is we, we look at cities exclusively based on their geographic region, the, the population demographics, and the quantum of waste and the growth. Today, all the smart cities have been talking about having a population of 10 million, three to four million. Even if you take the average Indian, that's about 1,000 tons of waste per day. That's not including retail, commercial, hotels, tourists. So when this comes to this, there's this small city in Sweden, which is called Norrköping, which has come up with this model, where it sees the municipal, the municipal body in charge of waste collection and wastewater. They, they send it to a water treatment plant and convert it to, say, biogas, which can fuel a bus, which can come back into the city. Then you have agriculture around the same city. They also produce some kind of waste. So that waste can either be converted to bioethanol or biogas, etc. Globally, they've done records. 15% of the vehicular traffic from service vehicles are attributed to garbage collection trucks driving in and around the city. The city is old, built 16 and maybe three, maybe about 20, 30, 40 years old. The infrastructure is dying. The sewage networks are dying. So when these need to be upgraded, unfortunately in India we have various departments, each are all running parallel to each other. The idea is to bring them into a dialogue and say, yes, water, are you going to, when are your lines coming for upgradation? When are your lines coming for sewage? And then try to find the most economical solution that time. As a company, we eliminate the movement of garbage trucks in the city. So we have a centralized waste collection plant which sucks all the garbage in the city to one particular point in a radius of three kilometers. So then we tie up based on the city with solutions for the treatment. My question now to, uh, if I could go from, the, from this side, uh, is what would you see as a very critical need or a critical success factor that, that need to be happening here to actually move forward in circular economy? Uh, we focus on sustainability a lot. Now let's look at one part of it. One thing is that we look at sustainability, which means that whatever equipments we produce, we try to make it as uh, sustainable, which means that it needs to have around 80 to 85 to 90 percent, which can be recycled. So, so for example, what we make is pump and pumping solutions. Now these things, what we try to do is 85 to 90 percent is what we try to make it uh, recyclable components into the pump which means that end of life, I still can recycle it. Right. Now then, then you'll ask me, what about the balance? What do you do with it? Now my answer for that would be, we are trying to have symbiotic partnership with companies who can use those 10 to 15% and make sure that that becomes their input to whatever they had to do. So we're trying to look at partners 
who can take the 10 to 15 percent what we have and then use it probably as their inputs. Or look at companies who are good in recycling those kinds of uh, components which we uh, normally, we can't do it because we are not uh, competent enough to do for that. So we look at companies who can do that for us. Now in that what we're trying to do is instead of selling my system or a solution, I try to do a performance contracting. What is the best part in the whole thing is that the equipment still belongs to us, the asset is ours. Now at end of the term of uh, the complete uh, cycle, say nine years or 10 years, depending upon what has been designed, we get it back into our value chain. So when we get back into our value chain, again, it looks like how much can I recycle or can I refurbish, use it as a different model, can I improve on the system what I have given? Can I use it somewhere else? This is basically what we are looking at. I am also working in Sikkim as Vice Chairman, Sikkim Disaster Management Authority. And Sikkim state I see as a workable model actually. This is a model state in circular economy. You can imagine that the whole waste, you know, which is being generated in villages or cities, uh, that is uh, circula in, in circulation. And it's a wealth, actually. It is not a waste. The second thing is plastic, you know. Plastic we banned so many years back. Even today, if the tourists are coming with plastics, you know, we collect it and then we, you know, recycle it. You send it to the company which is uh, recycling it. The, uh, there is no burning of wood. There is no burning of waste. I mean, this is the, I think, there is, this is the first state where you cannot even cra use crackers, even on festivals. Any festival, you cannot use crackers there. Fantastic. So all these uh, things, that is making a different environment. And number of cities, you know, where we are doing different experiments very successfully, but I think we will have to see holistically. Yes. If you are talking about circular economy, we cannot think only of urban cities. We will have to take villages into consideration. And India, you can't separate it. If you will separate it, it will not be workable. So in my opinion, I think Sikkim model uh, will be one. Actually, I'm now going to move to a, a, a chartered accountant <laughs> in Mr. Sarkar, because he, suddenly he is someone who can have a very strong commercial you know, uh, approach towards this, and I would be very keen to listen to his views on how he sees, based on his wonderful experience, that how this could move forward. The circular economy has to be based on the people who matter, which was discussed in the last session, and I think the sector-specific uh, 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 factor must also be considered when you're uh, of that particular place, when, when, you, when you consider reduction of uh, 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 recycling of your waste, the three R's which have to be used. So, uh, of course, I'll just leave it at that. I have a collation of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, matters which have been thrown up by the members of my chamber. I'll run through them. Uh, these are the critical technological and financial developments which are likely to drive smart city growth. Uh, Mr. Chaudhary mentioned the public-private partnership. Yes, it's very important. Uh, then the second one is on developments in the emerging economies. Of course, we have the blockchain technology, we have Internet of Things, IoT. But the hurdles which, which come in are in the form of standards, legislation, policies, rigid. Uh, there has been a suggestion that, uh, uh, and since uh, uh, Europe is playing a leading uh, role in this particular conclave, business can use Europe, uh, European unions general data protection regulation, which is GD, GDPR, as a, as a baseline to assess current gaps in compliance and help develop over overall prevention posture. Uh, next is the expansion of ICT infrastructure. Yes, we have the 5G rollout, which is about to happen. Cybersecurity is an area which is of great concern. Protection of critical city information and private citizen data, which is cyber, cyber terrorism. And lastly is on open data and big data analytics. Uh, analysis of da data on open data portals, for example, infrastructure, crime st statistics. There is, and we feel this way, that there's a lack of confidence in using benefiting from smart, smart city services. So we need to, uh, that, that needs to improve. And inclusivity 
uh, and socioeconomic consequences have to be studied which, uh, so that the confidence level, the comfort level goes up. Thank you so much. That is really excellent, Mr. Sarkar, because that kind of covers such a broad spectrum. Uh, Mr. Scholt, uh, I'm really keen to get your views because you are, you are not only a practitioner, but you are also an author who have written two books. Uh, one book is called Learning from Mumbai and the other one is called Learning from Delhi. So we are very keen to learn from you now what exactly is <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. One project I actually want to share with you uh, that we've been working on uh, over the last half a year is called the Barapula Drain. And I'm trying to find uh, new financial models for the circular industry. What if we uh, add a sewage infrastructure uh, to the Barapula drain in Delhi. That was our first, first test case. What if we separate the stormwater from the sewage water and treat it locally? Uh, what would happen uh, financially if we add a FAR? It's the FAR is the, the, the density, uh, 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 the, the maximum density available, flow error ratio. Uh, to that area, so we could all of a sudden, uh, uh, it was allowed to add one million square meters to the area. What would mean that financially? Uh, and can we pay, uh, with 20% of the profit, can we pay the uh, sewage infrastructure for that? Mm. So actually we could. So by, uh, so of course it's a catch-22, catch where, where, where are you in? Uh, if the uh, uh, open drain is still there, nobody wants to live there and the, the, the property pricing is, is very low, but what if we lower it? Property pr prices are rising, you ca could uh, fill the, the, the uh, empty plots of land, yeah. that's a lot of land. We find out that we could make nine billion over a stretch of uh, 2.4 kilometers. I have to move to now uh, Mr. Anshul Jain because he's the head of Asia Pacific for Danish Water Forum. So this is a circular approach to production, uh, be it water, energy, or materials. So basically, what, what does that mean? Uh, it means the main principle is, is that the residue from one company uh, or, or let's say a power plant becomes a resource for the other. Uh, and uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of circular, uh, uh, let's say, production factors that go into it. And uh, one factory, for example, gains from the energy uh, of the other thermal power plant. So we do have a very good uh, website. It's called symbiosis.dk. So for those of you who are interested, you can go through it. And uh, uh, it's in the municipality of Kalunbog. So I think that's a, that's a very good way of developing even a brownfield uh, uh, production system. Yes. Thank you very much. I think, uh, look, what I would just say one, 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 or one just quick point. It's been a fantastic panel discussion. Now, uh, uh, why are we here in a data sort of uh, base? Because I still believe that data has a very important role because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So good data metrics, good an analysis of where things are, are going to be a very important factor in moving forward and also measuring success and working out on where things can be improved. But um, I'm just, you know, once again, thank, thank the panel member for being such a fantastic panel. Thank you.